All right, folks, as I mentioned at the top of the show, coming on for the first time, you know him from the shotgun start. You know him from the fried egg. Mr. Andy Johnson. Andy, how are you today? Adam, I'm doing great. This is uh, my first podcast recorded in 2021. So, you know, that's uh, it's pretty exciting. New year, new new podcast uh, I'm going on. And uh, thanks for having me on. You're one of the OG podcasters. You had a podcast <laughs> before I had a podcast. So, Well, yours has definitely done great things. And you obviously uh, partner up with, uh, I don't know if you knew this or not. I actually used to work for Brendan Porat. No way. Yeah. When he was at uh, SB Nation. Yeah. I, I was one of his writers. And uh, Brendan's a great guy. He, to this day, was one of the best, I guess you can call him a boss <laughs> at mm -hmm. the time that I've ever had. He's, he's just a great guy. Yeah. He's a very, very talented dude. I, I, admit, I, w I wish he wrote more. I, you know, it's a bummer he's not writing for SB Nation anymore. And I wish he wrote more because he has like the best knack of picking out like this uh, stories that you didn't know you needed in your life uh yeah. very big weeks of tourists like you know a couple of years ago when he was when he did the the tiger monster uh you know <laughs> the the stands the like display stands mm -hmm. and gas stations story i mean he he's a, he's a super talented writer talented guy i mean he makes uh he makes me a lot better as a uh, podcaster yeah, he's he's fantastic, and and you're you're absolutely fantastic as well with with everything that you do with Shotgun Start as well as the fried egg and everything else. And we're going to get to all that. And people who are listening to this probably already know who you are. Before we get there, though, this has been a long-standing bucket list item out for me, and I need to address this because people are expecting this. The John Rom take that I had multiple years ago about John Rom being a fad. You rightfully were one of the first people that came out and said, you are an idiot. What are you talking about? And we're that, all idiots. So. That's well, an important thing. <laughs> that is an important thing. And certainly I've made many worse takes, I think. Actually, maybe not since that time. <laughs> but I have to say, one of the things that happened, and this is going to get into what I really want to ask you about, is just as content grows and as Twitter and all, you know, golf Twitter itself has become just this juggernaut of stuff because you're one of the OGs as well, the the crowd that came immediately following that take was just mind-bending to the point where the only thing I could think to do was to block you. <laughs> that, that, that is not the answer in this. And of course, since this is years ago, and I since have not, and I've become a big fan of what you do, but the just the 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 army of golf Twitter has grown to a degree that I didn't even think could get to. I mean, your take on that. I mean, it's just, it's a massive crowd these days. Yeah. I, it's, yeah, it depends. There's all different crowds too. That's the yeah. thing. <laughs> you know, you go run into a certain area. Like I'm never going to run into the equipment crowd. <laughs> that's a, that's a beehive that I don't want anything to do with. And I, I, I don't know anything about it really. Like mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not the most well versed in terms of uh, like specs of equipment, and uh, so I, I'm not. I don't. Want, I'm not eager to run in there. Then you got like you've got the PGA Tour fans, which is probably the biggest crowd. But then you've got you know golf architecture. You've mm -hmm. got the analytics crowds. You've got. I mean, it, it's it's unbelievable, and I think it's kind of like social media in general. That's like the beauty of the internet today is social media drives a lot of this, but it's allowed people to find like these little tiny niche subtopics that they want to nerd out about. And mm -hmm. they can find other people that are, are nerds like them about that topic. And it, whether or not anybody wants to admit it, everybody deep down is a nerd about a few things in life. And like <laughs> yeah. one of the things that I'm a huge nerd about is golf. You know, I'm not afraid to admit it, but like that's, like probably the thing I'm the biggest nerd about and everybody is a nerd in their own way. Like, you know, people that watch NFL football and all the games, like I listen to NFL podcasts and I, mm -hmm. you know, I listen to these podcasts and I don't know like a lot of, but I'm, I try to follow and trying to learn stuff about it. But some of these guys, they're nerds. They're huge nerds. They're huge NFL nerds. You know, everybody <laughs> is a nerd. <laughs> There's a lot of nerddom that goes around. And it's, it's funny because, we all kind of found each other in a way on uh, Twitter just happens to be the place where like we have this town hall of nerddom, let's just call it. And 
everyone gets together, they share thoughts, and then everyone either agrees or disagrees. But at the end of the day, we're all a very small group. I think I've noticed how everyone just basically knows everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's small and big, though, because there's like I until I started the fried egg, I was on Twitter, but I never posted. I would read. I would use it, but I was not active on it. So it's like I think the things that people forget sometimes is they feel like only I'm only talking to these people, but there in actuality are thousands of people that are reading it and making judgments that just aren't participating. Like there, the, there's a silent majority with Twitter. Right. Yeah. And that's something you have to be careful with is like understanding that look, the people that are vocal are actually like the minority. <laughs> yeah. That's actually a really good point. It's, it's, it takes something to put yourself out there and even more to respond appropriately when somebody sends something back. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's insane. It's definitely insane. now for the listeners, uh, for the select few who may not know who you are. I mean, you started the fried egg, uh, as I understand it with a newsletter was how it started out. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So still, still got the newsletter goes out three days a week. And then we just grew based off of that. So we started the newsletter. Then we, you know, I realized I needed something to uh, something somewhere people could sign up for the newsletter. So I started a website, wrote a few articles. I don't even I, I hope they're not on the website still. I'm not <laughs> positive. I, I was not a good writer. And then uh, and then after the website, we started a podcast and, um, you know, we do some YouTube video. We need to do more of it. But it, you know, we do a lot of stuff on golf course architecture. But that's kind of how it naturally grew. Um, I tried to do each phase decently well before I added the next phase. I, I think that's important is like not mm -hmm. trying to do everything at once, especially when you're small. Um, just like, I mean, you're a perfect example. Like you didn't have a YouTube channel. You did mm -hmm. a podcast for years without one. But now you got a YouTube channel and everything and in growing, you know, not responsibly, but understanding what you can do and, and making sure you're doing stuff well before you start trying to add other stuff to your plate. That's a really good point. And, you know, I think, you know, as we see more and more golf podcasts pop up and that's not even to mention how with the pandemic commute time going down, less people maybe listening in their cars, you know, all that stuff, doing one thing really well, getting good with that before you branch out to other things, that's really just going to do yourself more justice, I think. I mean, would you agree? Yeah, I think so. And you have to understand each thing medium's great for different stuff like i think like podcasts like you're never gonna blow up social media with with a podcast excerpt like that you know right. podcasts are long form they're digested by people you know a lot of times people are doing things when they're pod when they're listening to podcasts like you know doing dishes or w going for a walk or a run or working out or in a car commuting like that's when i digest podcasts like i can't react to something right away like um but like writing people are on their phones or they're they're actively reading it and you know that has a much higher ability to share in understanding different aspects and how people digest it i think one of the toughest things with a podcast and i think this was a benefit of blessing in disguise was the way i i hosted my podcast through my website for the first two years mm -hmm. I didn't know any, I had no clue what our download numbers were. Oh, same. Zero, zero idea. Mm -hmm. And what it did was like, I didn't worry about them. Like, and people, this is like the thing that I see with people that start podcasts now is like, oh, I only got X amount of downloads. And it's like, well, you can't worry about that out of the start. Like, it, all you have to do, like, people find good content. Like, if you create really, impactful stuff that people want to listen to that is different like that you being unique and having a perspective um if you do that then i think people will eventually find you at least that's what i believe in the, i believe in the internet that's my belief in humanity in general is that if you do good stuff people will eventually notice um and and with a podcast like listenership is really you know followers does not e equal listeners listenership mm -hmm. is really hard to get but what when you get them if you keep doing good stuff 
podcast listeners are are the greatest followers ever because they're so loyal and and they're they're awesome. You don't you know they aren't like social media followers that sometimes just want to argue that will argue if the sky is blue with you. Yeah, a hundred percent, absolutely. And you know, to get back to the um, the feedback loop, I guess you could call with social media. Uh, you are a hundred percent right. Follower count does not equate to listener count by any means, but in the same token, if you can get the conversation going and you guys do this really well with the shotgun start as well as at the, at the fried egg, you know, you find the enthusiasts that will spread the message a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's, it's the key when you're small is having people evangelize your product and right. what you're doing. And it's, you know, like especially early days of, of the fried egg, a lot of times like getting a message every couple of weeks or every couple of months from random people I'd never met that said like how much, you know, their experience with golf had changed because they were listening or reading or whatever. Like those are things that like get when you're a small content creator, get mm -hmm. you through like there are peaks and valleys and there are certain days where it's just, it just stinks, you know, where you just have no, you know, there you'll have stretches where you're like, ah, this is the greatest. And then you have days where you're like, ah, I just don't, what am I doing? Yeah, I, hear I, you. Yeah. I think like, you know, having evangelists is so, and that's like the thing is it's easier for people to get behind small operations. Like, I mean, since I started my business, I've become such a big proponent of shopping small and like, mm -hmm going and do anything I can spend money on locally because, you know, being a small business is just, it's, it's the toughest thing. And especially the early years. And, you know, you just, you don't know, there's so much uncertainty of whether it's going to work or not. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, so golf and filtered has become a business over the years. Um, listeners know that this isn't my full-time gig, but it's something that you do full-time and, I have to ask, and I imagine the answer to this is probably yes, but have you ever thought about, wow, what what am I doing? Like, have you ever had the thought of, I need to stop this? Because I've had it once a week. <laughs> um, I, you know, intermittently. Yeah. I think like one of the things when I, when I started this and, and jumped in full time is, you know, my, my salary probably dec became like a third of what it was. And right, right. You know, that was, uh, it's not easy, especially <laughs> no. like when you, I'm, I'm 34 now, but when you're early thirties and I was doing pretty well, and then you take like a giant <laughs> gargantuan step back. But meanwhile, like all of the expenses of life are like kind of starting to pile on where, you know, I've got like six or seven weddings a year. <laughs> you know, it's just like, you know, there are a lot of times where I'm just like, what, why, why am I doing this? Yeah. And then. You know, there's you get opportunities. Um, I've I've gotten opportunities along the way where I could go do something, but that in turn means that I would be closing or partially closing doors at at the fried egg. Mm -hmm. You know, like not doing my own thing. Well, I'd get paid really nicely. It it break. What am I doing? You know, like why? So. Yeah, there's been a lot of times, but at the same time, like I, I couldn't imagine at this point in my life going back into an office and working, you know, I worked for startups before where I was really passionate. I, you know, you have equity in the company, you have ownership of the company and you're early employee and you're doing all this stuff. But like now that I've st I started my own thing, I mean, that it, it took like what the way you feel about a startup um, job and, and the culture of a startup and it, and it just 10 X it or whatever you, uh, exponentially mm -hmm. more rewarding because I mean, it's, it's just a crazy, you know, you, you have your business, but being out on your own, it, it's a, uh, it's scary a lot of times. And like when a, when a pandemic rolls in, it's really scary, right. uh, but the, um, uh, if you can make it work, it's so awesome. It is very rewarding. And what you've done with 
not only the fried egg, but now with the shotgun start, I mean, you guys have that following. I've become a huge fan of everything that you guys do. And admittedly, it's one of those, it's one of those examples where you just said it yourself, you know, the cream rises to the top, you know, and you offer the takes that you offer, you offer the storylines, you offer the in-depth research in, in many instances, especially with the fried egg. And I know you have a team over there with Will and Garrett. You cut, you, you pump out a lot of content. I mean, what does your day-to-day look like? I've got a, a to-do list. <laughs> Oh, I've, I've gotten really big into lists lately. Mm-hmm. You know, my wife would say it's it's four years too late. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I, uh, I it, that's probably one of the cha- most challenging things that uh, recently that I face is is where I've got business stuff to do, um, which is like using complete different side of the brain to creating content, and you know as you do more and more um more and more time gets taken away and that's that's one of the hardest things to do but i think the just making sure that you're at least somewhat ready and there are podcasts where i'm not ready at all but you know you it's better off not hitting record than going into something completely unprepared and there are instances where it works out fine but for the most part just having at least with the shotgun start, having a co-host in Brendan helps a ton. He's he's always the more organized, more prepared uh, of the two of us. But having if I have three or four things that I want to talk about, we're going to get to 40 minutes. No problem. Mm-hmm. You know, um, with the fried egg, it's just, you know, it's understanding. I don't go into interviews with that very scripted, but it's understanding, hey, here are five places I want to go with this conversation. And, ex- and you know, some people get on me. They say I might be, you know, I'm not, I don't sound prepared with my questions and stuff. But what I'm trying to do with the fried egg is I try and listen to people's answers and drive questions based off of that until we hit a dead end. And then, and then I go back to my sheet of question, my sheet of topics really, and start, uh, down a new path and mm-hmm. i think like to me that's the way i uh, interview styles work for me everybody's different um but you know it it's i don't get a sp- i i would say that my biggest complaint is i don't spend enough time doing creative work at this point in, mm. in the friday but we have a great team uh obviously garrett is phenomenal his uh his stories are just you know great on the and then you know, his writing, which I think he doesn't, you know, at this point we're trying to figure out how we could get him to write more is mm-hmm. really great. And then Will does like an unbelievable job with the, the newsletter and all sorts of other things. He runs the pro shop. He, I mean, he keeps so much stuff organized and afloat. <laughs> so yeah, I, it's hard. I, it's a uh, days, days are busy and you don't always get, you have to like, I think the biggest thing is you have to get used to not, getting done everything you want to get done Mm. and you have to like things i'm trying to do now are set expectations with people that are expecting stuff from me better you know where hey you might not get this for two weeks yeah the the expectation setting for customers and it's it's weird to, to think about it at least it was for me you know you you have customers you might not think of something that you're trying to sell someone right out of the gate but at the end of the day you do whether in my case, whether it be a brand, whether it be the listeners to the show, whether it be the readers to the site, whatever, you still have to set those expectations a little bit. And I'd imagine that that's a little bit of give and take. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I, I mean, like the big thing that I is always the listener first. Like that's that's what we're going to do. We're always going to deliver our podcast, you know, shotgun start three times a week. Some most weeks more than that, it seems like now. Um, and then fried egg one to two podcasts a week and then three newsletters a week. Like you're going to get those because we set deadlines and that's what we do. Like, and that always is priority number one. And then everything else comes after that. What is your, uh, speaking of the shotgun start uh, podcast and the most recent shows, I listened to 
I haven't listened to the fourth part yet, but in part one, I believe Brendan said, these year end reviews are a pain in the neck. <laughs> Do you, would you agree? <laughs> well, I, it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, oh yeah. Whatever, whatever we're done with an episode of those, it, now this is the third year we've done them. Mm -hmm. um, whatever we're done, we're really happy. You know, it's, it's like, we're like, oh, that was awesome. Like, I'm always amazed at all the stuff I forget over the course of the year. The research is fun. It just takes, I mean, just to give you a little like background on, on the research process, like mm -hmm. basically it's like, doing a, an in-depth advanced Twitter search around the dates. You search around, you try and find everything that happened on Twitter. I read all of our newsletters that went out, show notes. Then it's like Googling stuff about different incidents that you've pulled up like from, from that. And each tournament takes like about an hour. Wow. Um, so, you know, when you start, doing like 25 events or you know it's just it's an insane amount and then the recording on top of it and mind you like <laughs> brenda's got four kids yeah and a right. wife i've got a wife it's the holiday season <laughs> and we're working harder than we work all year like that's the, the, that's the thing about those episodes and the spotlights are the these things take more time it's <laughs> it's so much more time than a week like this week with Kapalua is a fraction of the time that we just spent on Christmas, like the days before Christmas and the days before New Year's. Yeah, I just, I, I appreciate it. I'm laughing because I feel just, I don't do year end things probably for that reason, but you guys do it so well. And it's so damn funny just listening to these. Th and you know what I, what I really appreciate the most, I'm going to sound like a complete fanboy here, but you've created characters in golfers that we see every day like it's it's so good it's just it speaks to the creative back and forth that the two of you have it is well done on that i mean it's just so funny how much inane shit happens over the course of a year on the pga tour it's Whatever unbelievable you... how much like and how and this goes back to our golf twitter conversation how worked up people get <laughs> and about these stupid things like the roger sloan take is like my favorite take of 2020 where this <laughs> this guy who's relatively irrelevant on the pga tour I, I don't want to make any Canadian Rod, Roger Sloan fans mad at me, but he's about as irrelevant and generic of a PGA Tour player as you could find. And the guy goes, just in, we're in the middle of a pandemic. The PGA Tour is doing an unbelievable job of, of letting them even play tournaments. Like this guy, this guy's livelihood is playing tournaments. And he goes off about his wife not being able to accompany him on the golf course to this Canadian newsletter. I mean, it's just unbelievable that that was like a take and, and it happened in the year. And that's the stuff that I love about the year reviews is remembering that stuff because it helps like jog memory the next time Roger Sloan's in the news cycle. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going to do that for all your listeners as well. It's just, it's so damn funny. It's a good time to just spend in these instances. These are not short shows. I mean, these are two hour shows. It's oh. it's insane. <laughs> Getting flashbacks. The problem, the thing too is we every year at this point of the year we're like talking about oh we'll be better prepared next year and it's we don't do anything and it, <laughs> like the the it, it comes the time of the year and we're like oh shit we got to do year in review again right oh that's so good when you when you talk about uh I I lose it every time you bring up thick boy and I just. You know, this goes into a conversation I know that I want to get to, but about distance and everything. But uh, honest take, all jokes aside, I mean, what Bryson's doing to the game right now, where do you land? Do you land in the for it? It's OK. What? Oh, my God, he's going to break everything. Or are you somewhere in the middle? I think in terms of what he's doing, he's doing ex exactly what he's supposed to do as a professional athlete. Yeah. He is figuring out mastering his craft and with the equipment that's allowed to him today, he is doing everything he can do on a daily basis to maximize his ability to perform at the highest level. And I think this is, it's similar to, 
James Harden in a way in the NBA. I don't mm-hmm. know if you like people get really upset about the fouls and <laughs> the way he the manner in which he plays. But the guy is the greatest scorer maybe ever in the NBA. And all he's doing is the same thing Bryson. He's he's taken the rules at hand and he puts himself into the position to best use the the rules to score the basketball. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, like those guys are following him, you know, like it's just plain and simple. That's like, he's the guy hits his arm. It's because he's showing the ball so well, like that is skill. Like what Bryson's doing is extremely impressive because Mm -hmm. there are so many people that didn't believe adding distance and chasing distance was a good idea. And the thing that I keep going back to, and I've said this a couple times on on my podcast is the idea that this guy was a top 15 golfer and went under this radical transformation. Like this was not number 50 in the world who, you know, went and did all this crazy shit. This guy was essentially locked in. He was going to be making millions of dollars every Mm -hmm. single year for the, for 20 years. Um, And he went out and did something like, radical and it could have blown up in his face he could have lost his game but he didn't he got way better from it and i think that is the aspect of of the risk that he took to his career and his his in terms of like long-term earning potential was huge and it it paid off and you know Mm -hmm. i don't i don't know how long it'll last with the, the body you know i who knows how, you know, but he's maxing out what he can do. And for that, you have to, you know, really applaud Bryson. Now, like where I draw the, where I, where I find disappointment, I get disappointed with the USGA for being asleep at the wheel for 30 years and allowing golf to get to this point. And that, that is a, a an important point to bring up too, because uh, you and I agree on where distance is going how it's 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 getting to a point where look something has to give and and I've made the argument multiple times of look this isn't necessarily um you know don't take distance away from me no one's talking about the amateurs by the way you know if we're talking about the professionals playing on their playing field that to use the basketball analogy i mean they had to make multiple changes to three point line everything just to keep up with what was going on we're running out of options in golf. And I've, yeah. I think you've made similar arguments. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, a better example is like swimming. They mm. got rid of the body suits that right. all of a sudden all these world records were falling. And, you know, and what you saw, I, I went to high school with Mac Reavers who won a gold medal. Um, and his quotes about the, when they got rid of the body suits is great. Cause he was, you know, he was obviously one of the best swimmers in the world. And he's like, I think this is great because you know what? It's going to be a little harder and the more talented swimmers are going to rise to the, to the top. And I think, I think what gets lost though, everybody, everybody talks about the recreational golfer and I distance is a problem at every local golf course for the top end player. Mm -hmm. Like the same way that a PGA tour player dwarfs a 7,000 yard golf course, a, the best player at a club, dwarfs a 6,500 yard golf course. I agree. Uh, And I think back, like, I don't, I don't want to talk about my personal uh, playing much, but like the last state am I played in was at Calumet country club. It's like 6,700 yards par 70 for the tournament. And I didn't hit more than a nine iron into a green, you know? And to me, I'm not that long. And I think about it and it's like, okay, I probably should be hitting you know, more than a nine iron somewhere, but that's just the way golf has gotten. And like, whether or not people will admit it, like the very good players at clubs have the same, are are doing the same things. They aren't as good as the pros. They don't score like the pros, but what distance has become at the club level, even if you hit the ball far, you know, like you're never hitting more than wedges into greens at these 6,500 yard golf courses. So it's, it's, in actuality, a bigger problem than just at the professional level. That that's a good point, and you know, I think when people view it, the the so we talk a lot about equipment here, and the argument that I keep running into, which I just wholeheartedly disagree with, 
is you can't bifurcate the equipment. It's already bifurcated. Yeah. I mean, it, it already happens. right, right. And, and I think where we run into issues and, you know, Garrett uh, Morrison on Friday Egg did a really good series of uh, podcasts on the golf ball, the evolution of the golf ball. I, I absolutely love that. And what they speak to is the fact that, you know what, pros will sell the equipment, you know, for obvious reasons, sponsorships, whatever else, but that drives consumer behavior, obviously, otherwise they wouldn't do it. And it gets to the point of, all right, well, what is this actually doing to the game itself? That it almost becomes an afterthought. Everyone's chasing distance and everyone advertises distance. And I know I'm probably going to get in some trouble from the people that I partner with, but at some point, when is enough enough? And to your point, it actually extends down to the amateur ranks as well. Yeah, to me, I think the biggest the biggest point is like sustainability, is the idea of all these costs to keeping up and what, you know, the costs of of just having champion, like championship golf on one hand, but then also like local club golf encounters this too. It's like safety, driving range nets, like those cost a lot of money. Like mm -hmm. if you need to put a net in, your driving range to, or hey we want to go build 300 yards of tee tees that's going to cost you like ten thousand dollars a yard just in any or in ten thousand dollars an acre of added distance and maintainable turf a year like that this stuff adds up mm -hmm. and what is crazy to me is that like golf equipment i think is i saw the stat I forgot where, but golf, the golf industry is an $86 billion industry mm -hmm. and equipment makes up two or 3 billion of that. So you're, you're curtailing the entire game to a small subset of the, of the business of golf, which to me is crazy because what ends up happening is when all of a sudden the local club players can hit it over the driving range fence. The driving range fence gets installed. The new tee boxes get get installed. That costs a lot of money, you know. It, and then they have the ongoing maintenance cost of it, and all of that gets passed on to the consumer. Mm -hmm. And what happens is it costs more money for the for a regular golfer to go play, but it also takes a longer time because the golf course is longer, you know. And and just in general, there's more waiting. There's waiting on like. Jeff Shackelford always brings up a great point about the old LA open before everybody could reach 10, you know, the pace of play has gotten so bad there. They've had to cut the, the, the field size down mm -hmm. at the LA and now it's an invitational. But what happened is like, nobody got home on at, at 17 at Riv. Nobody got home at 11 at Riv. Nobody could really only a few people could drive the 10th green at Riv. Now everybody can. So everybody has to wait all the time. Yeah. It's, it becomes a, it's just a train wreck in every sense of the word. I mean, it, you, you get the delays and, you know, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole too far as to how, you know, perception impacts younger players, you know, you're seeing, but I will say this, I, you know, I'm not a, as strong a player. I, I, I've not played in tournaments that you've played in, but I've caddied and I've seen uh, at amateur events where some of the high schoolers, the top high schoolers play. They're taking forever to play the game. It's it's absurd. I'm sure you've seen this. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, they and there's no nobody is enforcing pace of play really. I I think like the AJGA does a decent job and and the USGA does a decent job at amateur events, but you know that I think like we got to think about like what are golf's two biggest hurdles, not problems, hurdles, right? What what would you say for a beginner? taking up golf like what are the biggest constraints uh taking up golf right now i would say cost and accessibility cost accessibility i would say time yeah and difficult like it's difficult it's not easy right mm -hmm. so difficulty it's these clubs aren't making it really much easier for a beginner right make no. it fractionally easier right but what the other impacts are is driving up cost of the game so it costs more to get into and i had a lot of friends that got into the game during this pandemic and they're asking me like hey how can i get an affordable set of clubs and i'm mm -hmm. like you know 
it kind of it's going to cost you like even if you do a good job buying eBay off eBay, it's going to cost you like 800 bucks at the bare minimum, 900 mm-hmm. bucks. And it's just that in itself is a crazy thing to get into something like I want like if you want to go ski, you go p- buy a lift pass and you go rent skis for like, you know, and you're getting good skis like you go rent clubs at a golf course. It costs a lot of money and they're usually shit. Right. Yeah. Right. It's not the whole, it's not the same uh, experience as renting skis. Um, but like with golf, like it's so expensive to get into. And that's a lot to do with equipment. And then the other thing is it takes so much damn time to play. Yeah. Yeah, it does. So like if you don't carve out four or five hours on a weekend, you can't really go play on a weekend morning. Let alone with any regularity to actually improve. Because even if you go practice, I mean, yeah, you can go do whatever you want at the range, but that just stacks on top of the, the actual going out and playing. So you now you're looking at maybe what ten hours a week if you actually want to take it seriously. But what comes back to t- putting a bow on this is distance has a impact on time because courses are longer, and people might argue it doesn't take longer. It's like if a course is longer, it's going to take you longer to walk it. That is like just a Matter of fact, if it's longer, it takes a cart longer to drive around it, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And if it's if it's longer, it's going to take longer to play. And if there's constant in- innovation from equipment, it's going to cost more and more money to play, right? So yeah, you get, you get hit on the equipment and the green feed side because of distance. And and just to clarify too, because uh, I agree with what you said, but to clarify, we're not against not to put words in your mouth, but we're not against innovation in equipment. I mean, innovation is a good thing. Yes. As long as something else doesn't fall off balance. Well, I mean, I think a lot of the innovation too, where where it's the last 15 years has gotten a little out of hand is like all this innovations build is, Hey, we're, we're helping out the like regular golfer. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's way more forgiving and that's a good thing. But the tour pros have this, massive hitting zone where if they hit it high toe it it's hot if they hit it low on the heel it's hot if they hit it you know like anywhere they hit it within that like they don't miss the sweet spot much or they and they don't miss the sweet spot by much but that's that effective hitting area has gotten so much bigger for them that like misses don't really lose yardage like they used to you know, right. like you go out and play with a persimmon, you hit it off the heel and you're like, oh God, that might go 210, you know? Yeah, right. Exactly. And, and you know, it's funny too, because when you think about courses, even in our area, so we're both in, in the Chicago area and the last full round of golf that I played uh, in 2020 was at Skokie. Yeah. And I know you've been there. I It's just an example of a course that it's not super long. They could They could stretch it out. <laughs> definitely but you don't have to play it from the tips to have a great challenge and i mean we had a blast out there and we played in probably under three hours i mean it, it was it was absolutely fantastic yeah it, that's a perfect example they had the western am a few years ago and Cameron champ played it i watched Cameron champ he had like 40 yards into every green out there it was just insane and mm-hmm. it, like granted he shot like 75 or something that round i i walked i was like this was one of the worst rounds of golf i've ever seen given where he was driving the ball mm-hmm. um but like that that's the reality is like for for those guys that it's a pitch and putt and it, it you know that's 7000 yards it hosted obviously a us open in the 20s but like to to host like the best amateurs, it, it turns into just a wedge fest, but that's the beautiful thing about the old courses is you could play them in three hours. Mm-hmm. You can't go play Harborside in three hours. No, it becomes, uh, I don't even know the right way to say it. It becomes more of a, an obstacle to enjoyment as opposed to enjoying where you actually are, where we, we absolutely loved where we were with Skokie. And obviously, you know, as I had mentioned to our mutual friend, Chris McEwen, who had actually gone and played uh, that round with me. Now you're looking at things that you might read on the fried for example, and you'll say, Oh, that's what that is. That's what Andy and Garrett are talking about. And you're actually able to appreciate that as opposed to, wow, why is this T box 500 yards away? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the connectivity of, of, uh, of a well put together golf course, it, the way it just, 
it gets you from green to tee effortlessly. Or if there is a walk, like a lot of the great golf courses have great walks, like Bandon Trails is one that I think of. Like there are some disconnected parts of that that golf course where you have to take a, you know, you're you're walking 200 yards to the next tee, but it is a beautiful, like, you know, hence the name Bandon Trails. Your you walk, it's an experience to get there. And I think that's one of the things with, that we're losing is so from a golf design standpoint, this is the really hard thing. Say you're designing a golf course and you want to host championships. So we need this course to be at least 7,600 yards, right? Do you build the green to tee transitions for the regular golfer? So do, do we walk from green and have that green right next to the middle tee Mm -hmm. or do we make it from the back to the back tee? You know? So it, Either way, if if they choose the back tee, everybody that's not playing the back tee has a 50-plus yard walk up to their tee. If they make it to the middle tee, anybody that's playing back of the middle tee has a 50-plus yard walk back <laughs> right. to their tee. So like, that's the other aspect of it, is that we're, we're creating that, what you just described of like the ability to kind of breeze through a three-hour round where everything just flows together is becoming harder and harder because the the difference in different distance from you know somebody playing the forward tee to the back tee is bigger than ever yeah it's it's a sad state of affairs for classic courses and you know it's uh, being in chicago as we both are it's also sad because we're not seeing tour events come here as often as perhaps they did in the past i don't live too far from cog hill for example and you know that's an entirely different episode i'm sure that we could talk about but you know it's a sad story <laughs> it's a very sad story and you know it's it's just bad because now you know bmw that's going to what colorado for this next year a couple of years is that true yeah it who knows i mean they got the president's cup but yeah right. they, it's it's sad that Chicago doesn't have a regular PGA tour stop. It's the same could be said about Boston and New York um, and Washington, DC and Philadelphia. Like you got these major, these are the places in the country that golf started and they don't have regular PGA tour stops. It's just crazy. Now, is that because, is that because of the the real estate that's just not available? We've done as much as we can to these courses. I mean, Olympia fields just got torn apart not too long ago, uh, or is it something of seasonal challenges? Um, I think it's, it, it has to do with the business side too, like sponsorships, um, mm-hmm. where BMW, I I don't know this for sure, but I'm sure it, it's advantageous for them to move their brand around the country to these different markets every couple of years um, for their big spot for their event. Uh, also for the Evans scholarship, which it, it's a big awareness driver in markets like it's started here in Chicago and it's huge here in Chicago, Evans scholars. But it, when they go to Philly, that's huge for them because that's that's all of a sudden a big awareness builder for every uh, all the clubs in Philly. So I think there's other reasons why, like losing the Western Open and it becoming the BMW was kind of, I think, the kiss of death for Chicago as a tour stop. And I, I, you know, I think it would have to come down to a business in Chicago saying, hey, we want a regular stop here and we're willing to pay the 10 million or whatever it is for a PGA Tour event every year. Yeah, totally agree. I hope they figure something out because it is a great, great area for folks who are listening to this who might not be familiar with the Chicagoland area. It's a great place to watch golf, certainly to play golf as well. Uh, and Andy, I know we're getting up uh, against the clock here, and I did want to get to at least one Twitter question that we did see come in, and I don't know if you saw this one, but right. we need to know if you're more concerned about the state of the ball, which you've already kind of talked a little bit about, or the state of the Bears organization. <laughs> um, I'd say that the more concerning thing is the uh, the Bears. You know, <laughs> I the ball. I, I feel very strongly about my opinions, but I also understand that I have bias. I think that's my biggest frustration with the whole distance debate is, is people's inability to put aside bias when they're looking at the argument and they, they look at, hey, you know, like a tour pro who has made millions of dollars using the equipment and, uh, and, and voices his concerns. I understand why he's got concerns. Like the guys made millions of dollars using the equipment that you know, got him there. Like I wouldn't want anything changed either, 
but the bears is much more depressing <laughs> just because, you know, I think that it's going to be some sort of pat on the back. We made the playoffs. The team stinks. You know, they might, they might go win next week. I feel like that's the way football works is they're just going to like somehow beat the Saints, but they aren't good. There's no hope in the future. The defense is getting old. The defense isn't particularly good and it costs a lot of money. And I just, I think we're in an utter disaster and the, the front office should not be coming back. Like that's, I think that's my concern is that they've done just enough to keep their job and we're going to be mired in this mediocrity for more <laughs> decades. Like it's insane. This is the yeah. first road playoff game they've played since 1995. It's insane. It is and it's not saying they're dominant and always have the one seed. It's just saying they don't make the playoffs very often. <laughs> do they extend Mitch? Do you think they do that? I think they're going to extend Mitch. I think Nagy's back. My hope is that pace is gone and, they hire somebody else who can make the decisions on the other two. <laughs> what about Just, you? What do you think? Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a bears fan. I'm actually a Patriots fan. And I know that people oh. give me a lot of crap for that. I believe me. I've heard all of it. Trust me, but I, I watch, me. I watch every bears game and you know, I, uh, I really feel sorry for diehard bear fans. And when I hear the passion and, and just the, the pain in your voice, when you talk about it, is this considered a victory Monday, by the way? No, it's not a victory Monday. I, 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 I have a few buddies that I, you know, we, we talk bears football all the time and I called one of them this morning and it was like, you know, like I've never felt, we both agreed. We've never felt so apathetic. <laughs> it's like towards hey. making the playoffs. Like we're, we're, it just doesn't even feel like we're eight and eight. It's just, they're, they're terrible. They're <laughs> horrible. They beat bad teams with the exception of like the Buccaneers. Right. They just are not a good football team. No, no, I agree with that. They're, I don't know. I'm not seeing anything in Mitch or Nagy or anyone that's going to give us any hope in this city. And I, I, gen I have family who I care about that really want this to happen. And it's just, it's not going to happen with this group. I mean, I feel similar about the bulls. I mean, I don't know. We could probably talk more about that. But what do you, that, you want to talk about the Bulls? I love the Bulls. I love I, basketball. I'm a huge basketball fan. I would probably write about basketball if I didn't write about golf. Honest yeah, to God. And, I would like to write about basketball. And it's, you know, there's just so many uh, parts to that organization. Billy Donovan coming on, I think, was a great move in my mind. But who the hell do we have around in the team? I mean, Zach Levine, whatever. Well, that's the thing. Is that everybody watched last year? Everybody's blaming Boylan. The front, like the front office, deserves most of the blame. But everybody's sure. blaming Boylan. They hope, oh, we're going to change the coaching staff and everything's going to be better. These guys are going to be really good. Well, they aren't very good. No. They, they have, like, I always think about is like, who are the guys on this team that would start for one of the title contenders? And I looked at the Bulls roster, and I don't think we have one player that would start on a title team. No, I agree with you. I, I like, I like the new guy, the draft pick. What, oh William? yeah. He's good. He's very good. He does. He got, he's like a smart basketball player. Yeah. He got a lot of on, on the Twitters. The NBA Twitter is just as bad as golf Twitter, by the way. Um, it's not just as bad. It's way worse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then he got, wasn't he the florist was, didn't he? Yeah. Help him, yeah. Okay. So that that's yeah. Family he, floral oh. shop. <laughs> Didn't start a game in college. I I mean he is pretty good. Mm -hmm. I uh, you know like the the problem really is when you look at like the drafts like Wendell Carter. You look at guys drafted after him, and you've got like the SGA. You've got um, who else was behind him? Uh, Mikel Bridges. Like mm -hmm. there are a lot of guys that are really proving to be very talented that were drafted. You know, right in the proximity of Wendell Carter. And then you look at Markinen hasn't really panned out. You yep. look at the, who was drafted around him. You know, nobody's really panned out that much from that draft. But you just look at the misses and then, you know, trade away Jimmy Butler. Mm. They they made a bold move and none of the guys have panned out. Like no. Zach Levine's fine. He's a, he would be a good six man, but he's not a superstar. And then you look at Markinen done like it just didn't work out. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure how many years can be a rebuilding year, but we're finding out. 
<laughs> well, I will say this, and I, I, one day I, I want to write about this whole thing. The Bulls underwent maybe the f- most devastating injury of any NBA franchise has ever gone through with Derrick Rose. Yes, just in terms of like, I feel my my heart still is hurts hurts from what happened. Chicago kid, first overall pick, hometown team becomes the youngest MVP ever. And then the yeah. next year is essentially done because of the knee injuries. And, you know, I, I, I've watched Pistons games and root for Derek Rose still, but like the simple fact is that we had that franchise altering guy and you have to have those in the NBA. And we, we had Derek Rose and people don't talk about this enough. We had Derek Rose and Jimmy Butler. Jimmy I know Butler wasn't Jimmy Butler yet, but he was, he was on the team and it's like, who knows what that team would have been had had Rose not gotten hurt. And that's like, I still, I go back. I remember the start of the injury problems. It was all Anthony Tolliver's fault in a Timberwolves <laughs> game. But, uh, you know, that's, that's the reality is like, my heart's still broken about this. Yeah, and too. no, no other fan base has gone through anything like that, that I like Boston fans will say, Oh, Len bias, Len bias. That is a tragic story, but he was not, a Chicago kid. He was not a Boston guy. No. Like that's the thing that was the gut wrenching part of it is we had our guy. He was going to be our guy for a decade, for another decade. Right. And we just lost him like that. I mean, we, the chills that, so uh, fans of the last dance, obviously chills that you got when you heard from North Carolina became something new when you saw or heard from Chicago. Yes. It's just, it was just an insane thing. And you know, I think if we had, when, when we talk again, Andy, I, I, cause I would like to, I think we talk more basketball at the beginning and then we finish with golf. Cause that's just more fun to talk about. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I can talk about basketball for hours. <laughs> All right, man. Well, Hey, I really love the fact that we had the chance to do this. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, you know where to find Andy folks. He's at the woke yoke on Twitter. You can find him at the as well as the shotgun start uh, podcast as a co-host with uh, Brendan Porath. Andy, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, Adam. It was a lot of fun.